Next up, we have Chris Pikert, who is right here. Good to see you. <laughs> Chris is a professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Michigan, my alma mater, go blue. He is a leader in lattice-based cryptography and also has a research interest in error-correcting codes, complexity theory, and security. Chris received his PhD from MIT CSAIL, where his advisor was none other than Silvio McCauley. Great, we'll get started. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's great to be back at MIT. It's been a number of years, too many years, uh, since I was sitting in these very seats uh, listening to lectures, and now it's uh, great to be back to give one. So um, try to uh, fit within time and leave a little bit of time for questions at the end and the all-important uh, next event. Um, but in this talk, I'll, uh, I'll be telling you about some of the work we've been doing at Algorand for the last year in the crypto research and engineering groups uh, on uh, state proofs. And I'll tell you what state proofs are all about. So uh, when we think about how can we make Algorand like, valuable for the long term at a, at a technical level, there are a lot of important problems and a lot of important goals. Um, but this will be about two of them, basically. So one of the goals that we have is to make Algorand uh, interoperable and to be able to exchange uh, value between Algorand and, and others, others being other blockchains, other entities out in the world that aren't uh, part of the Algorand network yet, okay? but they should be. All right? And the second goal that we'll talk about is uh, ensuring the integrity and the security of the Algorand chain uh, in the long term against possible attacks by uh, future quantum computers. Uh, and this is so-called post-quantum security in the cryptography lingo. So these are the two goals, uh, or two of the goals that we, we really think are important. And uh, in this talk, I'll be telling you about one new tool that we've uh, developed that addresses both of these goals, and it's called uh, Algorand State Proofs. So just to go a little bit into a little more of the motivation uh, behind these two goals. So the first being interoperability and exchange. Um, every Algorand node that's, that's running the Algorand protocol is uh, doing a great thing. It's frequently and quickly and very cheaply uh, reaching consensus with all the other nodes uh, about everything that's happening, about the accounts, about the balances, about transactions that are happening, about the results of smart contracts, you name it, right? And this is due to the magic of uh, the Algorand protocol, this pure proof of stake layer one protocol that uh, is really efficient um, and, and, and fast. So that's great for all those who are on the network and participating in the network, which you, know, you should be. But at this moment, not everybody is, right? So what about everybody who's outside the Algorand network? What about them? Um, and a few examples of, of entities that might be outside the network that might want to benefit from, uh, from working with Algorand. So one would be just new nodes, nodes that want to join the network, um, but if they really want to get a high assurance that they are agreeing with the rest of the nodes on the network, um, they might need to start verifying the entire history of the chain, you know, starting from the genesis block. Right? So that's a, a large startup cost, uh, an onboarding cost that you might not want to pay. Uh, a more challenging situation is that of uh, lightweight clients. So clients that might uh, not have a ton of computational power, not a lot of bandwidth. Maybe they go offline, come back online after a while, right? Um, for these kinds of clients, it's hard for them to fully participate in the network, and it's hard for them to follow and verify the progress of the chain uh, as they come and go. Right? And then an even more extreme uh, difficult case is what about other chains? Um, so take, for example, Ethereum. You can do smart contracts on Ethereum, but the cost of computation and of, of data uh, on Ethereum smart contracts is so high that you could never hope to run an Algorand node on an Ethereum smart contract. It's just completely out of the question. So how can other chains uh, you know, get information about what's happening on Algorand? They, they can't keep up with, with the, the full Algorand network. So our goal here is to allow all of these and, and others to be able to uh, securely interact and transact with, with the Algorand network um, while still preserving the fully you know, distributed and decentralized ethos that, that Algorand has. We don't want to put a lot of trust into just a few uh, entities, but rather keep it fully uh, distributed. Okay, so to the second goal, which is post-quantum security, uh, our story starts in 1994 uh, when Peter Shore, who's, who's now a professor here at MIT, uh, published this paper called Polynomial Time Algorithms for Prime Factorization and Discrete Logarithms on a Quantum Computer. Okay. 
So that was a mouthful. What does it mean? Well, bottom line, it means that a large-scale quantum computer, were it ever built, uh, would totally break all of the widely used cryptography uh, that we use and that we have ever used. OK, pretty bad, pretty bad. Um, and in particular, this includes all kinds of primitives that are used all throughout all the major blockchains uh, out there today, uh, digital signature algorithms, verifiable random functions, the most zero-knowledge proofs, on and on and on, you name it. Uh, and so in recognition of this problem, um, NIST and other agencies have started a process uh, to standardize some post-quantum cryptography. That's cryptography we can use today that will be secure against future quantum computers. And some decisions are imminent on that. So people have been working on this, you know, uh, people like me and others have been working on these problems for, um, you know, decades now. So, you know, that's, that's what can happen, right? Quantum computers can break these, these primitives, but concretely, what does that mean for, for blockchains? Right? So quantum computers could have a couple of different kinds of attacks that they can mount on blockchains. The first would, would be, once a quantum computer is developed, um, it could attack the future progress and development of a chain. Right? So that means it could, say, forge transactions and submit those transactions to the chain and just steal money from anybody's account. Or it could break the consensus that's, that's occurring and cause some kinds of forks or just denial of service, right? Shut down the, the evolution of the network. These are all things that a quantum computer could do in a, in a kind of forward-looking sense, right? It, it attacks uh, a, a chain as it's, as it's evolving. But we don't have to worry about those attacks immediately because quantum computers are off in the distance, and uh, those, are, those are attacks on the future uh, of the chain once the com quantum computers get developed. But a second more kind of subtle and insidious but, but no less dangerous attack would be one against the past history of the chain. Right? So, Quantum computer is developed sometime in the, in the future, maybe 15 or 20 years from now, and it can go back and look at the past history of really any chain you want and potentially fork an alternative history, right? You just break the cryptography used in the early days and uh, rewrite history, right? Uh, and cause chaos in the present day, right? Which is 15 years from now. Are you following me? Okay. So, you know, as George Orwell put it very nicely, whoever controls the past controls the future, right, in 1984. Right? And this was demonstrated even more vividly uh, in, an, in another work from the mid-1980s, right, which, you know, shows the dangers of rewriting history. Okay? So all of you my age and up know what I'm talking about. All right, so our goal today is, is to protect today's chain, the integrity of the chain that's being developed today, uh, and in the near future from potential future quantum attacks. We don't know when they're coming or if they're coming, but we need to be prepared. We need to protect today's assets uh, against these future attacks. Okay, so our, our, uh, our new tool for addressing both of these goals is something we're calling state proofs. Okay, so there's a picture at the bottom that I'll talk about in a second, but in a nutshell, what, what are state proofs? Um, basically a small-ish small uh, certificate which proves that a certain fraction of the total Algorand stake has attested to some specified data. And typically, the specified data would be like a summary hash of Algorand's recent state. Okay, so the stake and state. Right. So uh, a, a large enough fraction of, of Algorand agrees that, uh, for example, round 187's block header is XYZ. Right. So state proof is something that uh, kind of makes this claim. And it makes it in a verifiable way, in a, a, and, and the important thing about it is that this kind of state proof is cheaply verifiable outside of Algorand. You don't need to be participating in the Algorand network or anything like that. All you need is a small bit of uh, trusted data, which I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, just to get started. And then uh, you can verify state proofs, and when someone presents a state proof, it looks something like this. You can run some cryptographic checks over it and either say, yeah, that looks good, I believe it, and now I know what happened in round 187 or a summary of it, or I could say, no, that doesn't look good, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ignore this, you're a liar. Okay. Um, so this is cheaply verifiable and you won't, it won't be convincing. No one can create a convincing state proof unless this large fraction of the total Algorand stake has uh, actually really attested to that uh, statement. And what uh, bonus features are that this these state proofs also have post-quantum security, and they're even um, snark-friendly, or what I'll call snarky, and we'll talk about what that means a little bit later. But basically, this means we can protect the chain's you know, current and, and, and near-future history from, from future quantum attacks. 
Okay, so let's just talk about a couple of applications that these state proofs uh, should enable. We think there are gonna be a lot of really cool applications of them. Uh, but basically, they work by proving the Algorand uh, state and, and transactions beneath it uh, to other entities that are outside the network. So here's an example. We could do a bridge to another chain, which allow you to send assets from one chain to another, from Algorand to another chain and, and, and back, although you don't need the back is the easy part, um, in, in a way that really preserves the, the distributed security nature of things. So the way this would roughly work is that on some other chain like Ethereum, you'd have a smart contract running the state proof verifier, and it would periodically be provided uh, new state proofs as Algorand evolves and as those new state proofs are produced. And it would, uh, as it verifies these, it remembers the most recent you know, proven hash summary of the Algorand state. And then uh, the contract can then, uh, using that certified uh, summary state, it can then verify transactions or balances, whatever that, that people present to it, and, and be convinced that those things really did happen uh, over on Algorand. So the picture might look something like this. We have our smart contract up here on the other chain. Someone comes along and says, here's a, a state proof that here's you know, a summary of rounds 100 through 199. Oh, by the way, here's the new trusted data you would need to verify the next state proof. And, this, and the smart contract checks it, says, yeah, that looks good. Now I know what happened up to round 199. And uh, then later someone may say, okay, uh, I was trying to send money from me, Alice, on Algorand over to Bob on Ethereum, and uh, I paid this bridge account 100 algos that was directed toward Bob over on Ethereum, and I can give a proof of that relative to the um, summary, summary state here. Okay? And so the smart contract can check that and says, yes, I believe this payment was made, and so now I'll pay Bob, you know, tenth of an eighth or something over on Ethereum. And then as Algorand evolves, more things happen. A new state proof of the next hundred rounds gets produced and presented to the smart contract and, and so on and so forth. So this is how things can run. Um, that's one nice application of uh, state proofs for bridging between chains. Uh, another application, a little more prosaic, would be just enabling fast catch-up uh, on Algorand itself. So this would be allowing uh, new or returning or lightweight nodes to catch up to date uh, more quickly than they otherwise could. And the idea is basically pretty simple. Instead of verifying the entire chain from whenever you know, you, you, the genesis block or from whenever you last went offline, uh, just skip ahead with big leaps by verifying one uh, state proof for every you know, few hundred rounds or so. And even if you are online all the time and don't have to do this, you could still check these state proofs to get yourself a post-quantum security assurance that uh, what's happening on the chain is really uh, also post-quantum secure. Okay, so these are a couple of applications, but I think uh, there should be plenty, of, plenty more. Um, we'll do a little bit of a deeper dive. Uh, I presented more you know, technical stuff than I'll probably be able to cover, but I'll just mention a few of the cryptographic techniques and the trade-offs and point to the implementations. So, State proofs, a little more detail, the key properties and concepts behind them. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned, these are gonna be highly distributed. It really requires a supermajority of the Algorand stake to contribute to the production of a state proof. Uh, otherwise, it will not be feasible to create one. So the, the, the contributions come from all throughout Algorand, but then we can have a, a single um, untrusted but centralized prover that receives all these contributions and assembles a proof out of them. And the high-level idea is that this proof that uh, the prover produces is gonna contain just a small random fraction of the large number of contributions that come from all over throughout the network. Okay. And so cryptographic techniques are used to do kind of a random uh, selection, unpredictable selection of all these contributions and distill them down into a small number which then constitute the state proof. So to be able to verify a state proof, um, the verifier just needs to be able to start with some very small commitment to basically the account balances, okay, recent account balances. And these have uh, the participant's um, stake, basically, how much stake each participant holds, and public keys uh, that that participant uses to sign, uh, you know, to sign and make their contribution to the state proof. And then what's nice is that each subsequent state proof can update uh, and certify the next small commitment that would be needed to verify the next one and the next one and the next one. Uh, because, of course, people are transacting, stake is moving around from, from party to party, and so the, the amount of stake that each person has is, is changing over time. Okay, 
So I'll just put this up uh, in the interest of time. Um, if you want to take a picture or something or talk about the, the technicals of this. Uh, the idea is that we instantiate what are called compact certificates, uh, which is a paper by Macaulay et al. from about a year and a half ago. And we instantiate them top to bottom with, with post-quantum uh, primitives and give a full implementation. And uh, that is in, you know, in testing right now and is going to be deployed this uh, early this summer. OK, so to mention a couple of ingredients that we use here, uh, we, we have to use post-quantum ingredients from top to bottom. Otherwise, we wouldn't have post-quantum security and state proofs. So there are two main ones that we have to, to, to choose. Uh, the first is a vector commitment. And uh, for this, we use Merkle trees with a, what's called a subset sum uh, collision-resistant hash function. And this is a, a well-studied construction going back at least a couple of decades, 25 years or so. And uh, the spec and the code and implementation and everything are, are uh, fully available on our, on our GitHub. So you can check that out. And then the second ingredient is a, a really interesting one. <clears throat> we also need a digital signature. And for this, we're using uh, what's called Falcon, which is, the, which is one of the two uh, NIST finalists, um, lattice-based finalists for, for digital signatures. And we had to tweak this a little bit to make it uh, a deterministic mode. Um, so what does this deterministic mode thing mean? Um, so Falcon signatures, every signature has what's called a public uh, salt value in it. And um, the salt value is chosen at random by default just so that if you sign the same message multiple times, you don't actually get the same signature uh, uh, for, for each of these different times. So it makes it more safe to sign the same thing on different platforms, for example. We don't really need that for our use case. And uh, for snarkiness, we actually do need to use the same salt across all uh, of the signatures. Uh, and hence, we, what we do is we make this a deterministic signing process so that even if you sign the same message with the same salt, you'll get the same signature out uh, at the end. And you can you know, sign many times with the, the same key. So fortunately, uh, the Falcon interfaces and implementation were really nicely done. And we can do this deterministic mode as a very simple wrapper around uh, those existing interfaces. So you can check out the, the description, the motivation, uh, and the code uh, at this GitHub here. Okay. So one last uh, thought is that a big feature or a big uh, desire in our design of state proofs was to make them uh, snarky or snark friendly. Okay. So what does this mean? This is something that will enable ultra compression of state proofs into something really, really tiny uh, at, at the expense of a lot of work for the prover. Okay? But we're the prover. We don't mind. We'll, we'll do it for the community. Okay? So the idea is uh, that state proofs are pretty small, but they're still too big to feed and verify in an Ethereum smart contract. Ethereum smart contracts are so expensive, you can't, you know, you can't really do uh, full state proof verification on uh, Ethereum. So the idea is to replace a big, you know, this medium big state proof with a very tiny, very cheap to verify uh, snark proof. If you know what a snark proof is, that's great. But uh, otherwise, they're just kind of a magic. They allow you to take these big, big computations and squeeze them into a tiny, uh, a tiny amount of data in a verifiable way. All right, so what we're going to do is convert this state proof here into a snark proof that a valid state proof is known. OK, so it gets kind of meta here. Right? This is kind of proof composition. Uh, but basically, this says, I know a state proof that verifies and that says all this stuff over here. And now you can verify this. This is very small, and you can verify it very cheaply. Uh, and you can afford to do that uh, quite a lot on, on Ethereum uh, in an Ethereum smart contract. So fortunately, and this was one of the big reasons for our choices, this deterministic falcon and the subset sum hash, these verifications are mostly linear operations. Uh, and so they're quite snark friendly. And so it's feasible for us to do this kind of ultra compression uh, into a uh, snark proof. So that most of our work is, is done on this uh, front. And look for this later uh, this summer to, to hit, the, hit the public. All right, so overall summary, state proofs are great. Uh, they're going to allow us to easily verify Algorand's state uh, by entities that aren't on the Algorand network, just from using a tiny, tiny initial piece of trusted data. 
And uh, we're, we're convinced there are going to be a lot of applications. We're building out some of them, but I'm sure you will think of more. So um, you know, please think about it and let us know. Um, they also add long-term post-quantum security to the Algorand chain. So you can rely on the history, uh, even in, a, in our post-quantum future. And uh, they can be ultra-compressed using these uh, SNARK, uh, tiny, cheap-to-verify SNARK proofs. All right, so thank you very much for your attention. I'll be glad to take your questions. Five minutes for questions. If anybody has one. If you don't ask a question, I'm going to go talk through that complicated slide. <laughs> <laughs> Can you uh, just go a little more deeper into why it adds long-term post-quantum security? Yes, so why, why does this add long-term post-quantum security? So uh, in order to create a state proof, you have to have you know, at least 70% or whatever, some fraction of the um, uh, stake attest to whatever statement is being made. Right? Um, if you don't have that, then it's infeasible, uh, unless you can break the cryptography, it's infeasible to create a valid state proof. Right? So the only way to create a state proof is to actually have the 70% uh, contributions from 70% you know, or 80% of the network. Even if you had a quantum computer, you wouldn't be able to break the cryptography, we think, that, uh, that, that protects the, the state proof um, verification. So does that answer the, is that the question? Yeah. So even in the future, you know, you're trying to, you guys are going on a computer, you're trying to say, hey, at block 1,000, I'd like to create a fork, I'd like to create some fake state proof. My quantum computer can't do it, so I can't create that fork because people have been checking state proofs, you know, since we released them. Yeah. Yeah, it's an important question, of course. Oh, yeah, one more question. One sec. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you for your talk. I'm just really curious about the compression process and, you know, like how do you make sure that you sustain the proof aspect and what's the criteria for the whole compression? How do you make sure we don't lose, yeah. you know, any of the value in, in the process? Yeah, that's a, gr a great question. So we're kind of converting this uh, state proof into a snark proof, and we want these two to be kind of tightly coupled, right? We want to say that uh, if you have a good state proof, you can create a good snark proof. The more difficult or more subtle direction is, what does it mean to have a, a proof over here that validates, right? What we want to know and what we can show is that if you are able to convince the snark verifier of, a, you know, of this, okay, 70% say blah, 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 if you're able to convince the snark verifier of that, then you actually have to know a valid state proof of the exact same statement. Okay, so the only, and this is kind of where the cryptography magic comes in, right? But the magic of snarks is that you can't come up with a convincing proof over here unless you knew a convincing proof over here of the very same statement. How does that cut the cost? Yeah, so the cost of this uh, snark verifier is very cheap, very cheap. Over here, it's only like somewhat cheap. It's cheap enough for an ordinary computer to do, but not for an ETH, uh, ETH smart contract to do. Right? Um, and likewise, this is very tiny. Uh, this is pretty small, but too big to, to give to an ETH smart contract. So you know, we, have to, we had to do a whole lot of careful work to ensure that, indeed, the, 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 the statement here exactly corresponds to the, the statement being proven here. So it's you know, a lot of interesting technical work and design decisions that went into being able to do that properly. Yeah. Awesome. Chris, thank you so much. Thank you all. All right. <laughs>